you so much, uh, Dr. Maestra Joshi and Mr. Nirad Joshi for providing this opportunity to um, deliver a lecture on myopia control. I will be talking on myopia control 2020. I think uh, there are lots of webinars these days on myopia control and there are lots of research going on in myopia control. Uh, but this, this talk will be just a basic introduction to myopia control. And I'll give you a brief introduction to myopia control, um, which will make you one step ahead in terms of practicing myopia control in your uh, clinic. So there are a couple of um, pools in this, in this um, webinar. And I would really appreciate that you guys can go to the website www.slido.com and put this code here. Uh, there is the hash, and then after the hash, you put A446. And then once I get to the poll, you will be able to type or you will be able to answer the questions of the poll. So it will be very easy, and we can actually see the live uh, poll results in our screen here. So I think that will be very much um, interesting as well as interactive in terms of just me speaking, you know, it'll be more. Um, at the end of the lecture, we'll have a 15 minutes question and answer section. So you can go to www.slido.com and enter as a participant and put the code. And when the question and answer comes, you have to type in a question to ask for me. Um, and then I'll try to answer as much as possible, okay? So, um, just a quick introduction about me. I uh, completed my Bachelor of Optometry degree in 2008 from the Institute of Medicine, Kathmandu. Uh, in 2000, from 2012 to 2016, I was a doctoral candidate in the University of Auckland, New Zealand. My research was based in the pediatric visual development. And in, from 2000 to, 2018 to current, uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Center for Eye Research, TU Dublin Technology at University of Dublin in Ireland. So my research at the moment is looking at the um, pharmacological treatments for pharmacological interventions for myopia control, but I'm engaged in other different kinds of studies, supervising students and other digital health entrepreneurship as well. Okay. So um, today, what I'm going to cover today is I'll give you a brief over, overview of um, the burden of myopia, how severe is the problem. And why do we need to worry about myopia? We know we have been a lot of discussions about myopia. This is, um, you know, this is a severe problem or we have over 50% of the world's population is gonna be myopic and things like that. But why, need, why do we need to worry about myopia? Okay. And also I'll give you a brief um, touch on what works, what is the, what are the evidence-based research. Um, and I will touch basic on that and also provide you a minimum standard of care. What should be the minimum standard of care uh, based on the knowledge that we have so far? And also I will um, give you a couple of resources for clinicians who are so where to look for myopia resources on the internet and things like that, okay? So before going to the burden of myopia, I'm gonna ask you a quick poll here and as I mentioned earlier, go to www.slido.com and you will see this poll. And you will have to choose one option. There's, uh, there's, this is completely anonymous, so we'll have to choose one option here. What do you think is the estimated global prevalence of myopia at the moment in 2020? So go to your slido.com and put the answer and send it to me and then I'll see how um, accurate you are, okay? So I'll give one minute here. We've got three respondents so far. So go to www.slide.com and put that code and you will see this um, poll. Keep on going. 19 respondents, so 21. Remember, go to slido.com and put the code A446. Responses. I think I'll stop at 50, probably. If you're able to access the internet. I understand there might be some difficulties for someone, some people to access the internet. 
search for okay probably we're gonna see the answer here um okay so 33 32 percent are saying that it's 35 percent very good 25 percent um 27 percent of the people saying that it's 25 percent 27 percent of the people saying that it's 45 percent the prevalence and um 13 percent saying that it's 50 percent so the correct answer is 35 so you know it's i think 2.6 billion people are currently es estimated to be at the moment and i'm going to show you the uh, That's, I think, a majority of you uh, were aware of the prevalence of myopia in 2020. And uh, if you look at the prevalence, estimated prevalence of myopia from one of the researches published from the Brian Holder Vision Institute, by 2050, there, there's going to be 5 billion people, which is 50% of the world population. And myopia is the most common and fastest growing eye condition worldwide. As you can see here from 2002, 2000 to 2030, there is a rapid increase in myopia population, which is 3 billion in 2030, and it's going to increase to 5 billion in 2050, okay? And similarly, there is a 100, 560 million people uh, who will be high myopic in 2030. So it's the most common and fastest growing eye condition worldwide. And in some parts of Korea, 90% of adolescents have myopia, so it's a very severe condition. Now let's have a quick poll on how many of us are myopic among this 116 participants. Again, go to slido.com and type whether if you are myopic or not. Okay. And so let's see how what's the prevalence in this in the selected population. It's not a kind of a survey or research, but it's just a um, quick, you know, see quick observation how many of us are myopic. Okay, so we can see 67% of us are actually myopic, which is a lot, I think, but we don't have that much of, so you can still vote there, um, so which is significantly high. Uh, as we saw in our earlier graph, it, is, it was 30, 35% that the current population is estimated to be myopic. percent of the current population is myopic, but we, have saw, we saw that 67% of us are myopic, or 65%, which is a little bit fluctuating, but that's a significant high number. I think one of the reasons could be because myopia is significantly associated with education. So we're really educated. So that could be one of the reasons that we are having. And this is not uh, generalized, we cannot generalize this this uh, research, this this survey or observation to a gen like overall population because uh, we are a selected population. But it's still, we can see a significantly higher number of myopia among ourselves, okay? So, okay, now um, coming to the, it's in some parts, it's as in 2000, it was 8%, but in 2050, it's going to be 30%. In East Asia, currently uh, in 2000, 2000, it was 47%, but in 2050, it's going to be 65%. So in overall, in, in, on an average, all of the areas around the world are going to be myopic, or they're going to be, uh, of the population around the world, myopic and in 2050, 50% of the population is going to be myopic. Okay, so basically what I want to convey this message here is that um, myopia condition is very severe and if we don't work now, then it's going to be even more severe and severe in the future. So um, we need to act on myopia now. So looking at the relevance to Nepal, um, I got some evidence-based research, I extracted some data and saw that in 1999, the prevalence of myopia was less than 3%. Uh, in 2010, it was 4%. In another study, we showed that you know, myopia prevalence was 7%. And in 2013, it was 12%. But we don't have the latest data. So it has been already seven years that we had the recent data on myopia. So I'm assuming due to the globalization, urbanization, and the educational quality, intense education, it could be anywhere between 15 to 20%. So this is just my guess, but we need a standard study to identify or to find out what is the actual prevalence of myopia, okay? So 
we learned that there is a severe problem of myopia. Uh, but why do we need to worry about myopia? People think that, well, myopia is nothing. It's just wearing, we can correct myopia by just wearing glasses or spectacles. But why do we need to worry about myopia? So I might have a poll again here where you, where you put your thoughts, why do you need to worry about myopia? And uh, go to slido.com and um, you know, put your thoughts there. It's not the wrong answer. So why do you think you need to control myopia? Just put some of the open text there and then send, and I will see a word cloud over here, okay? If you're any, having any problems, just let me know, or Dr. Joshi know. Yeah, keep on writing here, yeah. There is no right or wrong answer. You can put your thoughts and completely anonymous, so nobody isn't gonna know that you are writing or typing an answer. I'd like everyone to participate. Can you put your thoughts? Why do you think myopia is important? Why do you need to worry about myopia? as much as possible. I understand that there, there could be some Wi-Fi disturbances in some places, but if you can, contribute so that I have, I'm how well versed are you in this myopia field or why is it myopia? Okay, I think that's very good. I see that there are very good answers there, very good points. Uh, that could be glaucoma, maculopathy, quality of life issues, probably vision threatening conditions, blindness, um, you know, um, retinal detachment as well. I can see that there is a retinal detachment. Um, yeah, most of them are focused on retinal blindness, maculopathy, definitely, myopic maculopathy. And yeah, I think I feel that the, the audience here, because we have a mix of audiences here with the students as well as um, the graduates, so there could be a little bit of bias, uh, biasness in the understanding, but overall, overall, I think that's pretty much good understanding of the um, rationale behind how, why we need to control myopia. So that's all good. Thank you so much for responding. That's very much appreciated. And I now have an, a quick awareness about, um, you know, the audience is well aware of the, even though it's not representative, we just have 30 responses, but it, I'm aware that uh, the audience is kind of, um, you know, uh, aware of uh, myopia control or the rationale behind myopia control. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, so now we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, thank you so much for responding to those, uh, to those polls there. So why do we need to worry about myopia? As you, as you, as you mentioned in the, in the text, in the slide, as we saw in the graphics there, so you all are correct. So there are lots of different myopic uh, diseases that are associated with high myopia or even low amount of myopia, such as myopic maculopathy, retinal detachment, cataract, and glaucoma. So if you have a um, refractive error of minus two diopters or less, then you are 2.2 times higher of having myopic maculopathy as compared to someone who is emetropic, who doesn't have myopia, okay? And this rapidly increases to around 126.8 times higher in, children, in people who have minus eight diopters of myopia. Similarly for retinal detachment, cataract, and glaucoma. So if somebody has minus two diopters of myopia, he or she could have three times higher of being, of, you know, um, experiencing retinal detachment as compared to someone who doesn't have myopia. 
similar to cataract and glaucoma. So this is the reason that we need to worry about myopia. If we don't halt the progression of myopia before it gets to a certain level, even um, minus two diopters, then the person of myopic individuals are at risk. So these are the rationale behind that we need to worry about myopia and start acting immediately. So myopia and ocular health, uh, there is an analogy where you can use that myopia is similar to, um, similar to a high IOP, is a, is a risk factor for glaucoma. So myopia is a risk factor for retinal diseases such as glaucoma, retinal detachment, cataract, and myopathy. Okay? And one of the key um, variables or parameters for myopia being a really bad for ocular health is the axial length. Axial length is the culprit behind all of these retinal complications or visual impairment. So as you can see here, um, if you have 24 millimeters of axial length, a very low risk of retinal complications. But if the axial length increases, then there is a rapid increase in different sorts of retinal problems, such as retinal detachment, retinal atrophy, peripapillary abnormalities, optic deformation, macular hole, all sorts of different retinal problems. And these retinal problems will ultimately cause visual impairment and even blindness. So axial length is the key precursor or key target for myopia control. Um, it's not the spherical equivalent power diopter, but it's the axial length that leads to stretching of the structure of the um, eyeball, which ultimately leads to different retinal degenerations, detachment, glaucoma, and other various several macular disorders. Okay. So uh, also myopic axial elongation is quite related to visual impairment. So in, in patients who are less than 60 years, we see that uh, if the patient have, if the patients have axial length of greater than 26 millimeters, they are 26 to 28 millimeters, they have two times like two times higher of having visual impairment. So visual impairment is defined as having visual agity equal to or less than 612. So as axial length increases, as you can see that the prevalence, the odds ratio, the likelihood of having visual impairment is rapidly increasing. So if someone is below 24 millimeters, there's a less chance. Above 30 millimeters, there is 24 times likely of having um, visual impairment as compared to who have less than 24 millimeters. But when the patients are greater than 60 years, this increases more. And if the actual length is greater than 30, 30 millimeters, then the, the, patient has, the patients have 93 times higher likelihood of having visual impairment as compared to those who don't have visual impairment. Okay, so actual length is directly relevant to visual impairment, related to visual impairment, as well as structural abnormalities of the eyeball. So, in myopia, we need to target axial length. So that's the key message here. Myopia, axial length, okay? So basically, target for myopia control should be axial length. In most of the cases, axial, axial length and the spherical equivalent refractive error is quite correlated. So if we control for spherical equivalent, equivalent refractive error, then axial length will be, can be automatically corrected. But some, in some cases, it's not true. So we need to target the axial length rather than refractive error. So, um, but there is a problem. In clinical practice, we don't have, we don't readily, readily uh, have um, axial length measurement devices and they're very costly. So we have LensStar, um, IOLMATER, Topcon Allergen uh, Biometry, but they're not available in day-to-day -day clinical practice, for, especially for optometric practice. So what's the, what, what can we do? There's a quick solution. It's not a precise solution for, you know, um, to, to evaluate the progression of myopia, but it can do to evaluate the risk. So if you <clears throat> use these formulas here, probably you might want to note, note them down and see how accurate these formulas are as compared to a biometry IL master. So this could be a research project for some of the students, some of the students or even graduates to see. Actually, I presented this kind of, this, this similar data in the International Myopia Conference in 2019, was it? Yeah. So <clears throat> use this formula, this formula to calculate the actual length and um, see if the 
they're similar to uh, IOL mask. Okay, so these formulas actually can provide estimation, but are not ideal for evaluating the progression of myopia. Okay, so you can use this formula to determine the risk. So if if you calculate the um, axial length using the spherical equivalent and average keratometry, and the person has a refract um, axial length of 26 millimeters, but his refractive area is just minus one diopters, okay, that person is at risk. Even though his spherical equivalent is minus one diopters, the person has 26 millimeters of axial length. And it could happen in clinical practice. There are lots of cases where such, such patients are And in such cases, you can immediately think that, well, even though the, the the child or the patient has minus one diopters of myopia, he or she might need a myopia control intervention, which is feasible to him, you, you, him or her. So you, you might need to consult with the patient or the parent about whether the, the, the child is at risk of having myopia progression. So we need to act immediately or, you know, depending on the available resources as well. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to go quickly touch on the proven myopia prevention and control methods. Um, I'm not gonna go in detail because Dr. Safal Kanal will cover these <clears throat> nitty gritty parts of proven myopia prevention and control methods in all detail and the basic, I mean, the, the, the necessary stuff that you require to practice in, a, in clinic. But I'm gonna just quickly touch on the uh, proven methods. So there's another poll, hope you are not, um, board with the polls i think it's engaging so that you have an active participation so um can you type what are the current available evidence-based myopia prevention and control methods on the app go to slido.com and type what are the currently available evidence-based myopia prevention and control methods i would like everybody to participate at least 50 people if you had access to internet or to devices If you have any problems, just write in the chat box or let us know. Good. Very good, keep them coming. Participate as much as you can. If you have internet access and devices, there is no right or wrong answer. I'll give you more seconds there. So we've got 25, 26 participants. So most of them are inclining towards atropine and ortho-K multifocal lenses. Interesting. Very good. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, I think I now appreciate that there's quite a good understanding on. You can keep on uh, writing on the on the app. Um, there is a good understanding of the methods, currently evidence-based methods, in myopia control, um, prevention and control. So atropine orthokeratology, yeah, they're the top um, based myopia control methods at the moment. Uh, for prevention, I don't see anyone putting outdoor exposure. Oh, there is outdoor activists as well. So yeah, I think the audience, at least 50% of the audience 
and a good understanding of the current evidence-based myopia prevention and control methods. I think that's understandable because we have got a mix of the audience, the students, as well as the graduates. So um, I'm hoping that majority of graduates are aware of the of the technology, uh, aware of the methods that are evidence-based for myopia prevention and control. So excellent. Thank you so much for the input. I think, um, yeah, I'm going to quickly discuss on the evidence-based methods as well. So, but whatever you have written here is all correct. Peripheral um, progressive lenses, now, even though the effect is not that great. Bifocal lenses, even though um, there is a conflicting evidence that they work. 0.01% uh, atropine, that's also, um, there's a lot of debate on whether 0.01% atropine actually correct, controls the axial length or not. Um, under correction for near vision, there's one comment there, under correction for near vision. I don't think that's, um, that's um, under correction has been debunked or had, has been rejected by a recent study from UK. So under correction is not correct, I think. Outdoor activities, uh, acupuncture. Mm. There was one systematic review on acupuncture, but I'm not sure that that showed any evidence of myopia control. Uh, but there are some marginal benefits, I think, but it's not widely accepted. Uh, so basically, yes, what you have written is all correct, but your thoughts are really appreciated. And thank you so much for participating in this poll. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide now. Okay, so the proven methods for myopia control, as you mentioned in the earlier slide, is atropine, correct? Orthokeratology, very good. Uh, DIMS lenses, so this is a new addition in the myopia control uh, field the defocus integrated multiple segment spectacle lenses. So this was developed by Carly Lam in Hong Kong. So she presented this, the, the technology in the All Nepal Optometry Conference uh, as well. And then outdoor exposure, there is a debate on whether outdoor exposure actually controls myopia, but there is a strong evidence prevents myopia from occurring, okay? And peripheral defocus contact lenses, uh, which eyesight lenses from Cooper Vision is one of the lenses to um, have been shown to be beneficial in myopia control, okay? So the, the, the points that you mentioned earlier is all correct, and thank you so much for that, okay? So uh, now, another question here. Among these methods, which method do you think has the highest effic efficacy in myopia control, particularly concerning axial length? So go to your slido.com and put your answer there. Among these methods, which method? So there's the atropine, 0.02% atropine, outdoor exposure, orthokeratology, multifocal soft contact lenses, and defocus incorporate multiple segments, spectacle lenses, okay? There is no right and wrong answer, it's completely anonymous. And I think this adds a little bit of interaction with the audience and the and presenter so that I'm not just presenting here so I can know your thoughts and as well. Remember, it's the axial length, not the spherical equivalent dioptic power, but the axial length. So which one do you think is the, has the highest efficacy in my upper control? Four to seven responses, very good. Fifty, I'll give you a few more seconds. There. Fifty-two. Okay, let's see the results, okay? It takes some time to come. Results. Okay, well, that's excellent. Okay, so we've got a mixed results here. Keep on voting if you want. Um, so 26% say that it's 0.01% atropine. 21% say that it's orthokeratology. Okay, 21% still say that it's DIMS lenses. 17% say that it's outdoor exposure and um, 0.02% say that it's atropine and 
multifocal subconderma is two percent. Okay, so yeah, I think the correct answer is defocus incorporated multiple segment spectacle lenses, which has probably sixty over sixty percent. 60% efficacy in controlling myopia. To be honest, uh, I think 0.01% uh, is the least effective after uh, outdoor exposure. So outdoor exposure don't, don't, doesn't have any um, effect on myopia control, rather than it has an effect on myopia prevention. So 0.01% uh, atropine had just 12% 12, 12 efficacy in the myopia control as compared to other higher doses. and in the current scenario, DIMS lenses is the has the highest efficacy. Okay, so thank you so much for participating in this poll. Um, based on current evidence, we are sure that the defocus induced incorporated multiple multiple segment spectacle lenses has the highest efficacy. So what? So yes, we understood that um, the of DIMS lenses is higher. But what does that mean to us? If you don't have the rights to prescribe, if you don't have the resources to prescribe myopia control methods, what does that mean to us? We are in a low resource setting at the moment. We don't have available my side contact lenses, we don't have progressive medicine lenses, we don't have the DIMS lenses, so what? So we need to balance, and um, or maybe do we have resources? Do we have the right to prescribe this, this, um, these interventions and things like that? So I'm just giving you a quick snapshot here on and the, um, you know, whether your nipples of tantris are allowed to practice or not, okay? So, till date, atropine has, has the highest efficacy for myopia control, both for refractive uh, dioptric value, spherical equivalent, and the axial length. And I don't think nipples of tantris is the most effective, and I think there's lots of side effects for 1% uh, atropine to prescribe, so I don't think we'll be able to prescribe that, and it's not mandated. I mean, recommended to prescribe that one, that one as well. Okay, zero point five percent atropine still may not be allowed to practice. Practice. Um, there's no regulations at such, but it's still risky, and there's a lot of side effects there. Even though the um, efficacy is higher, uh, but not as much as in the actual length. Zero point what one percent atropine? Mm, maybe, maybe not. We don't know even though efficacy is 25%. Uh, but with the lower doses here, 0.01% um, to 0.05%, uh, there is a variable a variable dose-based dose uh, relationship with the control on myopia, okay? So 0.01% control, uh, the efficacy of 0.01% for spherical equivalent, refractive, spherical equivalent refractive error is 27%, and for axial length, it's 12%. So it's not very much effective, but still there is something, it's better than nothing. And similarly for 0.02%, it's 43 and 29, and 0.05 is 67 and 51, okay? And these percentages are very low dose with limited, very minimal side effects. So we may be able to, optometrists may be able to prescribe them, okay? Orthokeratology, we don't need to worry about the spherical equivalent refractive error control because it's shaping the cornea, so the refractive error doesn't make sense. It's the actual length that it controls and it has a quite good uh, actual length control. And we are allowed to practice, but we don't know how accessible it is for our nipples optometrists, okay? Multifocal contact lenses, my sight lenses, it has an equivalent identical uh, myopia control on both spherical equivalent refractive error and the axial length, but it will take some time to come to Nepal. And, um, I'm not sure how affordable it, is, it will be the, to the patients, and we need to make a significant awareness campaign on myopia control among the general public in order to accept uh, them for the multifocal contact lenses. Again, multifocal spectacle lenses, which has a significant um, efficacy in myopia control for both axial length and the spherical refractive error, but still it will take on a few more years to get into the Nepalese market, or if, if only if it gets there. Uh, so I will give you a quick um, recommendation what we can do in low resource setting, but the details will be provided by Dr. Safal Kanal later in subsequent lectures. So stay tuned to those lectures, okay? Okay, so we now learned that uh, there is a, you know, um, we understood there is evidence-based practice, we have available resources and things like that, but what will be the minimum standard of care based on the current scenario, okay? So not correcting myopia to a comprehensive monitoring and management plan, okay? Not correcting myopia is the worst. So they look at their rolling eyes like, well, that's, that's not gonna happen. So we're not, 
we're not leaving someone with myopia without without correcting them okay single vision lenses that's better we, we full correction single vision lenses is better um, based on the comfort and uh, the clarity of the patient um, so that's better uh, single vision lenses plus conversation now is um, I practice in Nepal as well and other places as well so we are just prescribing single vision lenses and not talking anything about the myopia control but I think a good step is to provide single vision lenses and make them aware okay we have got myopia control methods and they, they seem to be working so would you like to try some other methods or if the patient is at high risk then you might have to um, you know recommend them a particular strategy to control myopia okay so I think Good step is providing single vision lenses and a quick conversation on whether myopia uh, myopia methods are available and you can opt to use those methods um, if the resources allow. Okay, and the better version is optical and chosen myopia control intervention. So now we're just having a conversation here, but here we've gonna gone to a one step ahead and given a proper myopia control intervention, okay? And after that, the best plan, the highest standard would be a comprehensive monitoring and management plan. So for example, you provided a 0.01% atropine as a myopia control method to a patient. So we are here then. And here you just talk about, well, this is the glasses, this is your prescription, and we have some myopia control methods if you would be interested, or if you're available, if your financial abilities Know, afford you to to um, accept or appreciate the myopia control methods. There is a conversation there, and I'm sure there are lots of people who will be uh, willing to uh, control, or willing to use myopia myopia control methods. But here we're actually giving them the myopia control methods, be it atropine or glasses or contact lenses and things. And here it's the best that the a comprehensive monitoring. So if you, for instance, if you give a 0.01 percent atropine, you'll have to follow up the patients every probably two weeks and then one month, three months and so on. So that's the best. Similarly for contact lenses, you need to take care of the contact lens aftercare, maybe probably one month, you would want to call and call them for one, after one month, three months, six months and so on. So think not correcting myopia, the worst, we're not gonna do that. And a comprehensive monitoring management plan is the best. So we, tar we target to be here, okay? But at the moment we are here. We're using single vision lenses. And some of us may have conversation with the patients about, well, we have this kind of deep, this kind of myopia control methods. Would you want to try? Or I think you need to, we might have to uh, try these methods to this kid, uh, you know, because for such and such reasons, his axial length is high and he might progress to high myopia and things like that. So there's a lot of awareness needed in this field. Okay. Now, well, we learned a lot of methods on myopia control, the burden of myopia, the risk factors, and but what myopia control method should I adopt? There's lots of options there. But I think good starting point is we need to have a clinical judgment as well based on the patient's family history, uh, patient's medical history, and um, you know outdoor exposure time and everything. We need to have a detailed history. But anything that works better than single vision lenses should be the priority at the moment. So just single vision lenses is not enough. Maybe it's just single vision lenses and a conversation with the patient that, well, you need to, you know, to the parent or the patient saying that you need to have a less um, indoor time or a more outdoor time, more outdoor exposure and things like that. So anything that works better than single vision lenses is a good start. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go to the guidelines for myopia control because that will be covered by Safal in, a, in subsequent lectures. So I'm going to give you a quick resources, where to look for resources if you have any problems with myopia control, okay? Uh, if you have any, if you want to learn articles, if you want to read some clinical cases, if you want to attend webinars, if you want to see journal articles and things like that, where do we, we go for myopia resources? There are a couple of resources I've uh, gathered here. So I presented this in the uh, All Nepal Optometry, no, it's the Nepal Refractive, Refractive Error Symposium as well. So uh, there are a couple of resources. There's heaps of resources for practitioners on the, uh, on the internet. So the Brian Holden, probably you might have heard of the Brian Holden calculator. So um, I'll, I'll have a link. So if somebody wants to have a link of all of the resources, I can send it to you probably um, later on. 
and there are like journals. There is a website called My Peer Profile. I'll come to that later. So there's heaps of resources on the internet. It's your enthusiasm or willingness to learn My Peer Control that, um, uh, and then you will get more, lots of resources there. Okay. Um, now this My Peer Profile is a very good website. Uh, this this website is established by a optometrist uh, in Australia. So she and her husband actually are very active in, I think they have made this, this website a full time profession for, for them. So um, there's a Facebook group, maybe lots of you are already in this Facebook group. So I think if you have any my peer related problems or you know, issues that you would like to know, there's some summary of the recent researches as well. You can go to this website, okay? That's a very good website. It's an all in one solution for my peer research and clinical practice. Now, Brian Holden Vision Institute has a, has a myopia management course. Um, they might be a little bit more expensive for us uh, for um, in our low resource setting. And we might not have, we might not be able to kind of get these courses, but I think good resources if you can afford these courses. And they also provide a kind of a really good overview of the prevalence, burden, everything regarding myopia. And one of the best resources I find is the review of myopia management journal. So students or even graduates might want to note these journals here. Um, this journal also regularly updates very interesting articles related to myopia, prevalence, myopia interventions, and all sorts of everything related to myopia in this journal. So I think it's, and it's very simple. It's not an actual journal. It's a target to, targeted to clinicians. So I think it's a very uh, good resource to go to. And recently there have been more myopia resources, uh, my myopia, man, man is myopia, treehouse eyes, and all this sort of, um, some of them are patient targets, targeted, some of them are targeted and things like that. But, but I think they're all good useful resources for a myopia control. Okay. So if somebody wants to take a note, here is the, um, where are the lists, there are some of the lists, common lists, but I can take a picture or, you know, you can, um, Later on, you can type it on your computer and see what there there's in, this, in, the, in these websites. So, but I think these are very good websites to um, as a, as a clinical perspective. There are lots of research articles in different journals, but uh, as a clinician, uh, research articles are a bit jaunty. So uh, we need to kind of have a simple understanding of myopia at the moment. So I think these these websites are very good resources. As I mentioned, the myopia management guidelines will be covered by Dr. Safal Kanal in subsequent lectures. So we have three myopia lectures and the rest of the two lectures will be, will be provided by Safal in the subsequent, uh, in, in, the, in the few weeks in the, uh, in the future, okay? Okay, I think uh, we're pretty much done with the lecture here. Um, so I've got the, some take home messages from the synthesized, the, contents of this presentation. So we all are aware that 50% of the world is going to be myopic and so are the Nepalese population. We're not no exception. So we are all going to, everybody's going to be myopic by 2050. Okay. Actual length. So remember, actual length is the target for myopia control. In some cases, for instance, in 0.01% atropine, it controls the spherical equivalent refractive quite well, but it's not as effective to control the actual length. So we need to find interventions or we need to implement interventions that are more effective in controlling actual length. And I showed you a formula where you can actually estimate actual length. Uh, it, is not an, it is not a formula to control or to monitor the prevalence, to monitor the effect of myopia control, but it is a formula to determine the risk. So to identify risk uh, a patient has, okay? Uh, myopia is a risk for ocular diseases such as myopia maculopathy, glaucoma, cataract, retinal detachment. Okay. And there are lots of effective interventions such as atropine, orthokeratology, multifocal soft contact lenses, multifocal spectacle lenses, and all of these, these are effective for myopia control. But based on your resources, based on your availability, based on your clinical judgment, and based on your knowledge, you'll have to implement these, these interventions in your clinical practice. And if we cannot do, if we don't have anything at all, if we don't have anything at all, then increased outdoors can be something that we could do. So if we don't have atrophy and if we don't have access to multifocal lenses, then at least um, two hours of outdoors is recommended for prevention of myopia. It might not help for people who are already myopic, 
but you can actually uh, recommend this to parents who are myopic to say that well if you are myopic your child could be myopic and it is recommended it is recommended that at least two hours of outdoors is um, you know it, two hours of outdoors is recommended to prevent myopia now i'm not going to go in detail of these re research studies uh, as i mentioned earlier Sofal Kanal will go in detail about the mechanism behind these interventions, okay? So in myopia, uh, like studying myopia control in the low resource settings, such as Nepal, what can we do? What can we do if we don't have any resources? So at this stage, we can start a conversation with the patients, with the parents that, well, the child is at risk and he or she may have myopia, uh, he may he or she may have be a risk of myopia related diseases and already have an actual length of this much. Um, so outdoor exposure and low dose atropine, even 0.01% is better than nothing. Um, I think there's a debate on the use of 0.01% saying that it does not affect control myopia uh, properly as the higher doses, but it's better than nothing. If it is available, then I think you should go for it. But remember, um, you need to ask all of the patient history, medical history, family history, all these sort of histories if, before you start a medical uh, intervention such as low dose atropine. So I will recommend you to consult with an ophthalmologist if possible or a medical physician to kind of um, work together for a low dose atropine. But I am sure 99% of the patients would not have a problem with low dose 0.01% atropine. But this is not the highest evidence, 0.01% is not, um, is not the optimal, but nothing is better than something. So uh, something's better than nothing. So 0.01% is um, okay for the moment, okay? All right, thank you so much for bearing with me all this time. Uh, if you have any queries regarding myopia control or research ideas on myopia, you can feel free to email me at polio.nabin at the red um, I'm happy to suggest you or any on my side in terms of myopia or or in optometry in general as well. Okay. And there is a question and answer section. Um, okay, so you can go to slido.com and ask questions here and then they will come up here. Uh, you don't have to type any you know, your name, just Type the question and they will come up over here and then I'll try to answer each of them. So there's one question saying that what age do we start intervening the myopia control methods? That's a very good question. Uh, depends on lots of factors. Depends on the level of myopia. Uh, depends on actual length. Uh, depends on the history. Uh, depends on the child's behavior and things like that. So there is a clinical judgment here as well as the clinical evidence that we need to implement when we start um, intervening for myopia control methods. Um, you know, this is a, I think I'll click that. Um, lots of questions here. I'll try to answer each of them. Um, and I mentioned you, there is one question on DIMS lenses. How do DIMS lenses? So this, this will come in the, 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 the subsequent lectures by but it's all uh, peripheral defocus based. So um, in the, if the peripheral, periphery of the eye is hyperopic defocus, it will be extension of the uh, elongation of actual lens. So we're incorporating some plus lenses to make the myopic defocus. So the, the tendency of the eyeball will be towards the regression or not, uh, not progression, okay? Um, I'll go through each of them here. Um, so at, at what age, depends. Uh, you'll learn more about this at, at what age do we start. It depends on the severity of myopia and um, the family history, the parental, the family history, parental history, the outdoor exposure to the kid, how much time the, the parents, the child spends on digital devices, near work and things like that. So you will learn a little bit more about this, 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 um, this, uh, these questions in the subsequent lectures. So it all depends and depends on the clinical judgments, but I would uh, definitely suggest using as early as possible if it's feasible to uh, apply my control. Okay. So I'm going to tick that up. Um, now, what are the risk factors for myopia? There are lots of risk factors for myopia. I think one of the biggest risk factors is uh, genetics, definitely. 
and and the parental history environment environment nowadays environment is realized to be the, one of the biggest risk factors for myopia um, so um, you know environment interaction, there's interaction between gene and environment and I think the latest research suggests that environment plays a significant role so in your work maximum uh, comes out, so. uh, outdoor exposure and things like that so those are the risk factors for my the environmental factors are considered to be the highest risk factors for my at the moment so close work indoor activities not much outdoor activities and things like that okay so there is a question on um can you elaborate about dims lenses so dims lenses has a 400 small lenses in the periphery uh, which are all plus lenses probably three adapters or two adapters that leads you to a myopic defocus in the retina. So hyperopic defocus will lead to axial elongation. But if you put plus lenses, there will be a myopic defocus in the periphery, which will tend to act as a um, kind of halting activity or the um, stoppage for axial elongation. Okay. And as I mentioned to you, these, these, these details will come in subsequent lectures. Uh, how do DIMS lenses? As I mentioned, it's the myopic defocus. It, it uh, induces the myopic defocus. Then that's, that's the reason that causes the um, regression or even the stoppage of actual elongation. Okay. Um, how could you explain what the peripheral defocus works on actual lens culture? As I mentioned, it's the hyperopic defocus. So hyperopic defocus will, do you know, an idea about hyperopic defocus means the the focus, focal point will be beyond retina so the eye will move uh, elongate to put that focal point into the retinal plane okay so that, that leads to actual elongation but if you have a myopic defocus which is in front of the retina then the eye will not move backward probably it will stop at that point because you might have to either move forward to put that uh, retinal point to, to put that focus in the retina uh, or it'll halt there, okay? So that's that's the basic principle, but as I mentioned, uh, there'll be another separate lecture which we'll discuss in detail, okay? Uh, what is the current status of multifocal lens prescription of myopic countries? What is its effectivity? Multifocal, I don't have the actual data in developed countries, but recently they have been, I think in Hong Kong, Singapore, they've already used the DIMS lenses. And in some places, bifocal, executive bifocal lenses and progressive edison lenses are also used, but the efficacy is in debate. So uh, multifocal lenses, if you are talking about the DIMS lenses, uh, they are currently used in some parts of Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and even in Australia uh, in some places. But uh, if you're talking about the bifocal lenses and uh, other uh, progressive edison lenses, I think they're no longer, some of the optometrists actually use them, uh, but I don't think they're used that often. But still, uh, I, think, I think they're used in the US, Australia, they're still used where there is no um, other interventions, okay? The effectivity, I think uh, I can't remember on the top of my head at the moment, the effectivity of these multifocal lenses, but it, as we discussed earlier, um, the effectivity of the DIMS lenses is 63%, uh, which is good. So, was that cut off of your my? Well, what was the cut off of your my PR data? Uh, I don't know which one. It was minus zero point five. Yeah, based on the Nepalese data. If you are talking about the Nepalese data, yes, it was zero point minus zero point five. Yeah, it's very clear that minus zero point five. Okay, what is the extreme age for effective effectiveness of these methods of those methods? Okay, um, this is a very interesting question. I think. There have been some discussions on adolescence myopia, adult myopia, and things like that. But at the moment, um, there is no hardcore evidence on the effectiveness of those methods on the, the extreme age that could, we could implement these methods. So basically, I think um, you could use in adults as well, I think. Um, and so if, the, if, the, if you think the myopia is progressing, then you can use in adults. But based on current evidence and research, there are like we are. Uh, looking at children between six years to 16 years. So that's the best is to intervene, okay? But there is no hardcore evidence when we, we what is the oldest age to um, implement those methods. 
how long does it take to see the desired effect after using atropine? I've been using it for more than three months, but my IPA is still progressing. Okay, very interesting question. Um, hmm. Generally, we see effect, we measure effect every six months, but we don't have an evidence, I don't remember, but in subsequent lectures, I'll let stuff all know that people are looking for this kind of evidence as well. So um, generally we look at every six months and every six months in the research studies, we look at in the research studies, we look at every six months. And I think uh, there, is a, some, there is some effect after six months, but uh, in some of the adult studies where looking at the core and things, it, you can see subsequent changes in a few, few hours as well. So I can't answer that question, how long does it take to see the desired effect? But in research, generally we, we follow up every six months. So. We'll have to wait uh, at least six months. And if you are an adult, then it could be it could be different. The, the, the data I'm talking here is for children, so it could be different for adults, okay? What is the dose recommended for atropine? Okay, this is a very good question. And I think, as I mentioned to you, I've got, I'm receiving these, all, all these questions on the efficacy and things like that. But I think, I, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a separate lecture on the dose recommended for atropine, the frequency as well. At the moment, uh, it's one drop per day. So we, we can have a separate lecture on the atropine itself, the researches, the doses, and when to stop, when to start, what is to start and things like that. But so I'm not in the situation of ask, answering this question concretely, but um, the recommended dose at the moment is there is a debate between 0.02% and 0.05%. Um, people say that 0.01% is okay, but in terms of actual length, it's not enough. So there is a debate between 0.025 and 0.05% atropine. So, um, you know, the efficacy is pretty much similar, uh, but 0.05% atropine will have more side effects. So you'll need to consider the side effects as well as the benefits. So I would say start with 0.01% and then increase to 0.025 and then 0.05 if the patient is, um, doesn't have any symptoms or has the good history, good physical history, medical history, okay? Uh, in Nepal, atropine 0.01% can you let us know what are the regime of drug and for how long the patient okay? Yeah, that's a very tricky question. And uh, we don't have any studies from Nepal on the efficacy of 0.01%, but I realized that there is one study doing study on the um, efficacy of my efficacy of 0.01% atropine. I don't know whether that's effective or not, but um, based on international scenario, it's one drop every night, uh, at least for one year. And we'll have to uh, re revisit the patient every three months or six months to see the excellent elongation or progression. And if not, then we'll have to increase the dose to 0.02% or even 0.05%. So um, at the moment, based on, this is not a clinical advice to be on, to, to, to um, you know, the, to recommend to you, but um, based on international clinical evidence, 0.01%, uh, one drop in each eye before nighttime, uh, before bed, is recommended and every six months follow-up is required, okay? Uh, after 25 years, our biological process is being reduced. So is it possible to increase actual length after 25 or 30 years? As I mentioned, I think there are only a very few studies on the biological processes after 20 or 25 or 30 years. So um, I'm not 100% sure I'm not in the situation to answer this question because I haven't gone through the if efficacy of um, adult myopia progression, but there, there has been some interest in some of the community uh, myopia control communities, uh, community websites. I've seen a lot of discussion on what, you know, do we need to control myopia in adults as well? And they have said that, why not trying it if it's still progressing? So I think, yes, it is possible to increase uh, actual length after 25 or 30 years, um, but there are more evidence is required, okay? Uh, what do you think the main cause of actual elongation is peripheral diffusion or the overconversions or multifactorial? Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, this is a very good question, and there has been lots of discussion on the uh, um, you know the cause of actual elongation. I think it's uh, mostly derived by peripheral defocus, but it's multifactorial, definitely multi multifactorial. And convergence, there there has been some studies on binocular vision function in myopes and non myopes and things like that. And they have, they have been shown they have shown some um, effect of con over convergence and things like that. But I think it's multifactorial, definitely multifactorial in terms of peripheral defocus because our myopic myopic the periphery of the myopic eye is uh, more hyperopic defocused. So um, I think there is a 
2 as well as the um, you know a genetic influence in um, myopia myopia occurrence but yes it is multifactorial as you, as you say that it's multifactorial and there could be some role in conversions as well binocular function as well but there is no concrete evidence on the binocular vision function and myopia okay is there any geographical factor to increase the myopia yes yes i think uh, there are some evidences that there are geographical in some geography color regions they have more myopia but i don't know why maybe it's the the environment uh, the nutrition uh, and the educational levels there, educational um, pressure there. So, for instance, in Singapore and um, for instance, Singapore and Hong Kong, they have high South Korea. They have high prevalence of myopia because their education is very intense. They do not have enough outdoor exposure. So, there could be some geographical factor, but it's mostly due to their environmental uh, activities. I think environmental influence. I think. Um, under correcting myopia, generate myopic defocus can under correcting help us to control myopia? Yes, this is a very interesting question. Yeah, I was also thinking that, well, under correcting myopia in the central region. So, in terms of uh, myopic questions, we are um, incorporating. Where is that? Okay, the question. I think where is that? Yeah. Um, Okay, so the question was, I, I'll miss the question, where was it? Oh, they did, undercorrecting myopia, yes, an undercorrecting myopia, there was an undercorrecting myopia stuff there. Um, so I think there, there, was a stud, there was a study in the UK saying that undercorrecting, whether undercorrecting myopia will lead to um, myopia control, but it was not true. So only the peripheral um, defocus will lead to myopia control, not the central defocus. So, Full correction of the central myopia is essential in terms of myopia control. Okay, so yes, I am. I realize that uh, Dr. Sirjan Adhikari has done some study in atropine, but um, okay, the result was good. We will see. We will have to wait and see the publication there as well um, in terms of myopia control in. So there is another question on recently children are not exposed to outdoor activity due to quarantine. So what do we suggest is in this critical condition? Um, yes, I agree that uh, there was some article on the on one of the journals that quarantine could lead to more myopia, but uh, I think it's just a short duration of time, just um, two months, three months. So we might not see that much of difference, but still, it's better to um, you know um, better to advise them to go outdoors at least, and expose light at least two hours a day, if possible. Otherwise, limiting their indoor activities in terms of watching their watching television or digital devices is good. So, okay, that's good. I think that's it. If you have any more questions, just write me down and I'll try to answer the question um, uh, as much as possible. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much. Bye.